Well, good evening. Welcome. I'm Joan Marshall, director of the Bullock Museum, and I'm glad to see that uh, you didn't stay home for that women's basketball championship tonight <laughs> to see Louisville win. That's where my money is. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, introducing our speaker tonight, Michael G Gillette. He is both a, a great colleague and friend of mine. He is currently the executive director of Humanities Texas, where he's been since 2003. He's formerly director of LBJ Presidential Library's Oral History Program from 1976 to 1991. And he also served as director for the Center of Legislative Archives at the National Archives in Washington, DC. He received his PhD in history from the University of Texas. And he has also authored the book, Launching the War on Poverty in Oral History. His newest book, which he's gonna be talking about tonight, is <laughs> Lady Bird Johnson and Oral History. It was published in December by Oxford University Press. I have always been fascinated by Mrs. Johnson and, and the dichotomy between her seemingly quiet demeanor and the extraordinary accomplishments that she uh, had during her lifetime. Um, but the quote that I like best about the book reads, oral histories are too often disappointing because of an unprepared interviewer or interviewee. But this is an example of the genre at its best. Now, I frequently see Michael jogging at Town Lake, and I often wondered how he managed to hold his day job, exercise, and write two books. So I hope you'll give us your insight on that, too. Please welcome Michael Gillette. Thank, thank you, Joan. It's a privilege to be here and thank all of you for coming spread out. Um, I want to say a word about my jogging since Joan brought it up. I must be the world's slowest jogger. I get passed by women pushing carriages and I don't mean a competitive slow edgy in front of me. I mean just blowing by me like I'm going the other way. So. Um, but I'm steady. Um, as, as Joan mentioned, I headed the library's oral history program. I, I really grew up at the LBJ library. I was still in my 20s when I went to work for them. And within a year or two, I started doing the oral histories. And then uh, I guess I was probably 30 years old when I started interviewing Mrs. Johnson and interviewed her over a span of 14 years. Uh, some 37 interviews before I was uh, called to the mothership in Washington, the National Archives. All of the presidential libraries are part of the National Archives. But um, it was a fascinating experience for me to spend that time with her and to get to know her and to um, see the, uh, her life through her, through her eyes. These interviews were sealed for years until, uh, decades even, until May 2011. I hadn't seen them in 20, 30 plus <laughs> years. Some of them in the library opened them in May 2011. So uh, part of this book uh, uh, relates to work that I did when I was a young man, and part of it relates to someone who is the age that she was when she first started recording these, these interviews. So I do have a different perspective. But um, one of my fondest memories of her took place when I was sitting in my oral history office at the, at the library in the spring of 1978. And uh, Mrs. Johnson called and I remember her first words were, hello Mike, how would you like to do something zany? And I quickly uh, racked my brain to try to imagine what the former first lady could mean by zany. But she quickly explained she invited me to accompany her and Liz Carpenter to her 50th high school reunion at Marshall High. And of course, uh, we had already started the interviews on um, her early life and I jumped at the chance to, to go. And this trip was really an adventure in time travel. It's one that gave rich context to the narrative that she was recording in our interviews. Uh, 
I remember when we went to the reunion, everyone was just thrilled to see her and that seeing her among her old friends that she'd known most of her life brought out all of her youth and, and warmth and um, it, was, it was just so interesting to see her in that context. But she was no longer the shy young country girl who had been afraid that she might have to give a graduation speech in 1928 and was vastly relieved when two classmates uh, outranked her and thereby uh, gave the, uh, the graduation speeches. This, this evening, uh, when we were in, in Marshall at the reunion, she gave a wonderfully eloquent talk that was filled with nostalgia and humor about the times that they had spent together. And uh, she seemed so comfortable in that setting. But the trip to East Texas also uh, took us to a number of landmarks from her youth. We uh, walked around the brick house, the antebellum uh, plantation home where she'd been born in Karnak. We stopped at the little country cemetery in Scottsville where her mother had was buried when Lady Bird was only five years old. And uh, finally, we, um, we uh, climbed into John Boats and ventured out into Caddo Lake with its majestic, haunting cypress trees uh, filled with, uh, with Spanish moss. Have any of you ever been to Caddo Lake? Well, if you have, you know what an enchanting place it is. And it's easy to see how Mrs. Johnson developed a love of nature and natural beauty in that spectacular setting. It's, you can read all you want, but until you're there and, and just sense its, its beauty, you, you don't really know the, uh, the power of it. Um, these interviews that uh, I recorded with Mrs. Johnson, of course, form the, the narrative of the book, uh, Lady Bird Johnson and Oral History. It is really her story in her own words. I stripped out uh, most of my questions and only when they added some necessary context or explanation did I leave the question in. So it really leads, reads more like her narrative. And of course, she had a wonderful gift to the English language. Uh, her descriptive powers uh, were so exquisite. I used to say that her oral prose is better than my written prose, and uh, that's a true statement. The book uh, contains three concurrent tracks. The, the first track is really her um, perceptive observations of life in Washington and Austin over the span of four decades. She gives us wonderful descriptions, portraits of the events and people who shaped our modern world. The second track charts the phenomenal political rise of LBJ through uh, a combination of good fortune, uh, consummate political skill and resourcefulness, and incredibly hard work. We follow him from one campaign to the next, and we see all of those elements in play. But the third and most compelling track is her transformation from a shy country girl into one of the most admired and uh, effective first ladies in American history. And I thought I would visit with you a little bit about this transformation and discuss some of the factors that uh, influence the transformation. Uh, if Caddo Lake inspired her love of natural beauty, that area that she grew up in in Karnak, deep east Texas, also imposed a uh, a lot of self-reliance and isolation. It was a very lonely setting. And keep in mind that, that her mother had, had died when she was five, and her father spent all day working at his store. So she didn't have a lot of companionship. Her maiden aunt, Effie, uh, her mother's sister, came and spent a lot of time with her. But she was, uh, as she put it, left to her own devices a lot of the time.
and she developed a great love of reading during this period. And this lifelong love of reading was really the first aspect of her education and a very important one because she was always an avid reader throughout her life. Uh, the second uh, significant event in her education took place when she, uh, uh, against her father's preference, uh, attended St. Mary's College for Girls in Dallas for two years. And it was there at this uh, private college that she um, gained a, a love of the English language and uh, developed a sense of how to use the language effectively, uh, graphically in, um, in uh, describing things. Then uh, she also developed a deep religious faith in, um, in Dallas at St. Mary. She became an Episcopalian and that, uh, that faith stayed with her throughout her life. After St. Mary's came four years at the University of Texas here in Austin, and um, the academic rigor that, uh, that the university provided, but also a very active social life. For the first time, she became truly independent and uh, really extended herself, overcame some of her shyness. She was still shy but uh, she had the active social life that she'd never really had before. Um, if we step back and just um, look in on her life, Claudia Taylor's life in mid-1934, we see a young woman who had a, a great uh, intellectual curiosity. Uh, she was popular but shy. She was not beautiful, but she was attractive, and her charming presence always seemed to uh, uh, attract a boyfriend. She had a number of, of reasonably serious boyfriends when, each year when she was in college. Um, she uh, has just received her second degree, bachelor's degree, this one in journalism after her first in history. She has also earned a secondary teaching certificate, and she has taken courses in shorthand and typing so that if necessary, she can take a job as a secretary. But you know, she doesn't have any career plans at all. She, um, as she phrased it, she thought she would just go where fate led me. And, um, in fact, instead of going out and looking for a job in the Great Depression, she took a graduation trip to New York and Washington. And then she moved back to Karnak to spend a year with her father uh, helping him remodel the brick house. A very laudable pursuit, but not exactly burning up the track with ambition. But. Lady Bird Johnson's, Lady Bird Taylor's life changes dramatically on September the 5th, 1934, when she visits a friend at the state capitol, a woman named uh, Eugenia Boringer. Um, while she's visiting this, this old friend from East Texas in the office, Linda Johnson walks in, and uh, they go have drinks, the three of them, and then, uh, uh, he asked her to have breakfast with her the next morning. And after breakfast and after a ride around Austin, an all-day ride, he asked her to marry him. So uh, I'm going to let her describe this, this part, this first day. And this, I'm gonna, you're going to hear about an hour and a half or a two-hour discussion in about four or five minutes but you're going to hear the range of emotions that she went through at the time. Uh, Lindsay Wall, who has produced all of these uh, wonderful slides from the photo collection of the LBJ Library, is also operating a uh, audio of the interview. So, Lindsay, I'll ask you to... I know there was something electric going, and he did ask me to have breakfast with him the next morning, mm -hmm. and that... Um, I was sort of unsure whether I wanted to or not, and um, didn't call to, to, to make it firm. I, um, 
And I started by to, to see Hugo Cuny, whose office was next door to the Driscoll. And there was Lyndon sitting in the dining room uh, on the other side of this big plate glass window where I was just walking past. He looked up and <laughs> flagged me down, and he was there waiting for me. And I don't know whether psychologically I intended to, all the time I meant to go or not. In any case, it was a, a near miss. After breakfast, and somehow after the architect, and, and he had his vague, we did get in his car and ride and ride and ride, and he did a great deal of talking. Um, well, how was he different from the other young men that you knew at this point? Was there anything distinctive about him that struck you right off? Well, he came on strong, and he was, um, uh, 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 very, very um, direct and uh, dynamic, and you just had a sense of this is. Um, I didn't know quite what to make of him. Did you sense that magnitude? I did, very, quite, uh, quite clearly. And I do believe before the day was over, he did ask me to marry him, and I thought he was just out of his mind. I mean, I, I just, I just, uh, uh, it was. Okay. It was very, uh, I'm a slow, considered sort of person generally, and certainly not to, I get into quick conclusions or much rash behavior. <laughs> and, um... Do you remember where you were when you proposed? Were you still riding around in the car? You, we were. And we drove around all day long, and during part of it, we did drive around some of my favorite haunts, which were the lovely little country roads around Austin, where there were these clear streams running over um, uh, the white rocks and the chalky limestone, and um, it was exciting. It was intensely exciting, also a little bit frightening, because uh, I uh, was far from sure I wanted to know him any better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, do you remember where you were when he proposed? No, I don't. Um, was it, it was on the first day? I, I do believe it was. It sounds absolutely too outrageous, but he has said so many times himself, and I think he's correct. Read that when he proposed, you didn't say yes, you didn't say no. No, I didn't. I just sat there with my mouth open, kind of. <laughs> well, so she is forced to make the most important decision of her life in a very short span of time. He pesters her for two and a half months. He issues an ultimatum, and he basically says, "Either marry me now, or." I'm going to walk out of your life forever. Well, this uh, creates a terrible dilemma for her. And, but during a madcap ride across Texas from Karnak to San Antonio, she um, ultimately uh, relents and uh, agrees to marry him, uh, overriding her in a caution. Now, she probably could not have found someone more different, more of an opposite than LBJ. If opposites attract, you can see that there was, must have been something electric going on, as she said, because she was conservative, cautious, and judicious, while he was liberal, impulsive, and always in a hurry. Um, she had a calm, gracious, uh, shy demeanor while he was expansive, demanding, and volatile in temperament. She was, uh, of course, uh, thrifty while he was given to acts of extravagant generosity. And uh, she was essentially a private, self-reliant person while he desperately needed to have people around him, just almost complete opposites. But what did she see in Lyndon Johnson? The people that I interviewed who knew, who had known him in the early 30s, 
mid-1930s and early 40s have, have stressed how dynamic and attractive he was and how exciting it was to be around him. Exciting was the word that you heard her use in describing that first day together. Um, but there was another factor, and that was his, uh, his drive, his forcefulness, his honest, raw ambition. She wrote him a letter during the time they were courting, and she said, I adore you for being so ambitious. So he really supplied that ambition that gives drive and direction and sense of purpose to life. That's what she was missing. And uh, later on in our interviews, she describes that sense of purpose. When less than a year after their, their wedding, uh, and they were living in Washington, he secured a job as a Texas director of the National Youth Administration, a New Deal agency. And uh, so they had an opportunity to move back to Austin. And in this job, he had to work just incredible hours, weekends, nights, all the time, and travel all over the state. I asked her if this meant that they didn't get to spend enough time together. And here's her answer. You didn't have enough time together during this? We certainly didn't have much time together. But then, um, fortunately, I was always independent of Fatty, and, um, and I did not feel deprived or, or mad at the job or mad at him. And I, I always felt that each job we were in was a significant job. And uh, Mayor Tom Miller used to have a saying, something that each of us is uh, in search of the significant. And uh, it, it was satisfying and it was significant. Now, I, I wanted it to succeed. I liked being part of it. Oh, I must say, I had a mighty small role. Cool. If I had to do it over again, I think I would have uh, learned more about it and tried to be more part of it. Ah. You didn't have a. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was someone that. Mrs. Johnson described as a regular Henry Higgins because he stretched her as he did everyone around him, challenging them to do more than they thought was possible. And he is responsible in good measure for a lot of this transformation that took place after her marriage to LBJ. She also had a profound effect on him in his political career, which I'll refer to in a minute. But he certainly changed her. Let, let me cite three or four examples. The first one was that he enlisted her to run his congressional office when he was on active duty in the Navy in 1942. So in going to the office every day, and she couldn't vote, but she could do everything else that a congressman would do. She learned everything about constituent service. She learned everything about the congressional district. She learned how to deal with all of the executive branch agencies and the people in them. And she learned about legislation. But more importantly, she developed a sense of confidence that she could do a job. She had never had to do anything like this before. And this was important to her. This gave her a sense of accomplishment so that the next year, after they brought an Austin radio station, she moved back to Austin and spent the spring reorganizing and managing that station, which became the centerpiece of their f financial empire. Also, at LBJ's behest, she became increasingly active in each of his campaigns. She was basically shut out of the 1937 campaign, his first race for Congress. But after that, despite her shyness about speaking in public, she was increasingly drawn into the role of a surrogate. And uh, in the 1948 campaign, if you read the chapter on that 
campaign, I think you'll conclude, as I did, that he wouldn't have even been elected if it hadn't been for Lady Bird Johnson. And the women in the campaign, in the runoff campaign, they mobilized and crisscrossed the state. Um, an example of how he <coughs> challenged her to do things that she was reluctant to do politically. He asked her to go see Miriam Ferguson, former governor Ma Ferguson, and enlist her help in the campaign. And she was obviously reluctant to do it, shy about doing it. He said, you mean you have two degrees from the University of Texas and you're not willing to do this? So she did it. In the early 50s, LBJ concluded that every Texan needed a ranch. You know, it was part of the image, the Western image, the cowboy image. And so without bothering to discuss this with Mrs. Johnson, he went out and bought the dilapidated LBJ ranch from his widowed aunt. But guess who had to move back to Austin and restore that ranch and make it habitable? Lady Bird Johnson. And uh, she had to do all sorts of things, from interviewing foremen and, and uh, creating a road and deciding which walls to keep and how to, how to restore the place. And uh, so she tackled uh, yet another project during that period. But um, she still uh, continued to grow in this period. Uh, one of the frustrating things to her was that she'd never had a home. For eight years of marriage, they were just constantly moving back and forth from one rental to the next and back and forth from Washington to Texas. And um, in the fall of 1942, she really started looking in earnest for a house in Washington. And um, I'm going to describe how she influenced LBJ in the purchase of this, their first home. I hunted uh, the, the real estate portion of the newspaper. And Sunday afternoon was the time to ride around and look at the possibilities. Lyndon and John Connolly and I were riding around to see one that I had been advertised out in uh, right off of Connecticut Avenue uh, in Elkhart Hills, as it was called, at 4921 30 Place Northwest. Um, I wanted to buy it immediately, partly as a result of having um, uh, waited so long, and, and partly because I thought, um, the, uh, by the time I finished doing uh, what I wanted to, it, it would acquire charm, and it had so many basics. Um, I walked out of the house thinking that we had really agreed to buy it. As we drove down the street, I said, uh, Linda, when are you going to give him a check? Uh, and Linda said, well, we're not going to buy it. And, and I burst into tears, <laughs> which were very angry tears, <laughs> something I practically never uh, did. I said, all I've got to look forward to is one more damn campaign. <laughs> And I really uh, let you know what I thought of, uh, of the 14 or so moves we had made uh, in the, uh, let me see, how many years of marriage would that be by that time? From 30, about my age, mm -hmm. close to eight. So he looked shocked. And John looked at him and got a grin and said, I think you better go back and buy that house. <laughs> 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 And he did. <laughs> In addition to the house on 30th place, Mrs. Johnson hired a fabulous cook, Zephyr Wright from Marshall, Texas. And Zephyr Wright, uh, her southern comfort food appealed to all of these powerful southern senators and house members like Sam Rayburn and Richard Russell. So the house became a gathering point for so many informal, often unscheduled dinners for 10, 12, 15 people. 
And uh, that created a, a significant burden on Mrs. Johnson and Zephyr Wright, but it also gave her a very active seat at the table. She was privy to a lot of conversations and a lot of discussions that most congressional spouses were not privy to. She described a lot of evenings where she would be the only woman there with all of these men talking politics and rehashing things. So she learned a great deal from, from these dinners at, at um, her home. The way she described this kind of influence was the society that he thrust me into, in Washington especially. And uh, this society consisted not only of the Texas establishment in Washington, which was a very powerful, close-knit group. They had like six committee chairs and the Speaker of the House and, and powerful senators. But it also included all the organizations that congressional spouses belong to. The 75th Club, if your husband was elected in the seven, to the 75th Congress for the first time, you were always a member of that. And then when he went to the Senate, it was the 81st Club. She was a member of that too. There was a congressional club that all the congressional wives belonged to. And then there was the Senate Ladies Club when he went to the Senate. If you combine all of these organizations, what you had was a virtual salon ongoing for 30 years that included some very, very bright, sophisticated women that got together and just shared stories and insights and information. This was really a wonderful education for her. And if you read that chapter in the book, you see how much uh, insight and um, interesting experiences she was uh, privy to. Um, all of these experiences served her very well as an apprenticeship when she ultimately moved into the White House, as did her three years as a vice president's wife, often as a stand-in for Jacqueline Kennedy in the White House. She, she used to say that suddenly she found herself in a role for which she had not rehearsed. Maybe not rehearsed, but she was certainly prepared for it after 30 years in Washington and all of the experiences she'd had. She entered the ha White House uh, and assembled a, a tremendous professional staff, really the first first lady to do that. And she enlisted a lot of, of uh, influential women <coughs> to beautify and conserve uh, the nation's environment, beginning with the District of Columbia, they created a spectacular showcase in the nation's capital so that uh, the millions of tourists who came there could see what was possible to replicate in their own hometowns. Uh, then she traveled uh, across the country in a whole series of trips to draw attention to the beauty of this country and the threats to that beauty with uh, environmental issues. But she always viewed beautification as just one thread of a much larger tapestry that included clean air, clean water, uh, green space, urban parks, uh, cultural heritage tourism, and the addition of many new national parks. Um, yet the environmental uh, effort on her part was only part of her, her legacy as First Lady. She continued Jacqueline Kennedy's uh, effort to uh, furnish the White House with authentic uh, antiques, and she uh, persuaded many donors to uh, contribute just tremendous American art, uh, significant American art for the White House. She also, in the fall of 1964, <coughs> rode the Lady Bird special campaign train through the South and became the first First Lady in American history to campaign independently of her husband. Um, she organized women doers luncheons to recognize the achievements of outstanding women. She embraced Project Head Start and gave it the prominence of a White House launch. And uh, then she presided over countless state dinners and foreign trips and other events, including two White House weddings. At the same time, she provided what she described as an island of peace 
for President Johnson during his turbulent, heady presidency of the 1960s. In addition to all of that, she recorded a diary of 1,750,000 words covering her White House years. So is that not discipline? In terms of her legacy, that's pretty much it. But Liz Carpenter had a wonderful uh, observation about Mrs. Johnson. She said that Mrs. Johnson was wise to pick beautification as a cause because it's so visible. It's something we can see all around us. And of course, when she moved back to Texas, uh, she uh, gave the Highway Beautification Awards for the most beautiful wildflowers. She created the National Wildflower Center, now the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And as I'm reminded whenever I go jogging, she beautified Town Lake, now Lady Bird Lake, and the hike and bike trail. And uh, I remember being out there with her uh, one time or two and after this was recently done and the joggers would go by and just wave and say thank you Mrs. Johnson as they would pass. Um, she herself was unfailingly modest in talking about her legacy. She said well all I did was make a lot of little lists and check them off one by one but um, I think uh, I would say that she was a strong, smart Southern woman uh, with uh, remarkable grace and uh, sensitivity to the needs of others. Her self-discipline, resilience, and just unerring good judgment always served her well in public life. But she never lost that youthful spirit and uh, adventurous spirit and uh, an extraordinary capacity for friendship. If you were ever around her, that was so obvious, that capacity for friendship. And um, it was my good fortune to experience that. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer your questions now if you have any questions or comments. Yes. There was a particular incident when they were in the White House where I believe it was Earth the Kid and caused a scene, a scene about the, about his friend about the, the presidency and the Vietnam War and everything. And, and uh, I think it was a function that she that Lady Bird had hosted. So how did it how did that how did she recover from that? How did how did that affect her? The Vietnam War? Mm -hmm. I think that she shared President Johnson's frustration at not being able to find a, a resolution to that conflict. Uh, I think she, like LBJ, approached Vietnam from the, the standpoint of the Cold War as uh, essentially uh, a them versus us attitude. Uh, the, uh, the communists on one side, the, the Democrats. I don't think she ever really saw it as a revolution, as a nationalistic revolution. She saw it as an international threat. Um, and I know when she talked about it, in the interviews, it was one of it was a discussion of just vexation for her that it had been the, and and frankly, she talked about how it had uh, impaired a lot of his domestic initiatives. That uh, she realized even the things that she was interested in had been stunted because of Vietnam, as so many of the great society programs had. Any other questions? Yes. Marshall High. She did. She did. It was. Uh, 
I think it was the early 40s. I think it was about 1942. Liz went to Washington as a as a journalist, uh, working with uh, a, um, uh, a one-woman news service, essentially, and uh, of course coming from Austin, and she met the Johnsons, but she really didn't know them all that well when she got married to her husband, Les Carpenter, and the Johnsons hosted a, an event, a reception for them or something like that, really reached out to them. And um, they were social friends. She was part of the Texas establishment. Their kids grew up together. The, the Carpenter kids and the Johnson girls <coughs> knew each other. And it was just, they were friends of Sam Rayburn's. And you'd, you'd go to these parties and they would all be there <coughs> together. But I think it was really during the 1960 campaign when, uh, when, uh, Mrs. Johnson phoned Liz Carpenter, who was a working journalist, of course, and, and asked her to share the great adventure of her lives and, um, and travel with her and, and become sort of a press secretary, and she did. Then she went to work for the Vice President Johnson's staff, but after he moved into the White, after he became president, she moved over to the East Wing to become Mrs. Johnson's press secretary and staff director. So uh, it's interesting. She and Liz were, were also very close personal friends. I mean, they, it, was, it was not, it, it was a respectful relationship, but it was also one of, of great friendships. And, and Liz was a whole lot more like LBJ than she was like Mrs. Johnson. This was another case where opposites attract her. And, and, uh, when you would be with them sometime, um, Liz would say something perfectly outrageous, as she often did, and, and Mrs. Johnson would just blink her eyes and laugh, you know, just <laughs> shake her head. And, uh, but she enjoyed Liz enormously. One of my interviews was done uh, with Mrs. Johnson every year would go to Acapulco in January with some, some of her closest friends. But she always, she was so disciplined that she always felt better about these vacations if she worked some every day. And I was at work. I got to go along and, and do the <laughs> interviews. But I remember one wonderful evening when Liz, who was there, and Lindy Boggs. Do you all know who Lindy Boggs is? Um, was at the, at the time married to Hale Boggs, a congressman from New Orleans. And then she later succeeded him after his death, the disappearance in an airplane crash. Uh, but the three, those, three young, those three women talking about what their lives had been like as young women in Washington in the 40s and 50s, it was just fascinating. And each one had so many great stories to tell. I, I wish I'd take the whole evening. <laughs> yes? Yes, uh, Lyndon, as he went up through politics within uh, Texas, tended to be moderate to conservative, uh, not, not real conservative, but he tended to be, on, he, he, he had to get through Texas politics. But when he became president, he was the one who created the Great Society, which was one of the most liberal uh, thrusts at the federal level since FDR. Did she have any comments upon that change in his appearance, because I suspect he didn't really change, but his appearance seemed to change. She did. Uh, she referred to it time and again as a miracle of Texas politics, that <laughs> he was able to succeed as well as he did in such a conservative state. Um, you'll recall he was elected in 1937 as a New Deal advocate. Uh, in fact, he ran on the court packing bill that, that uh, President Roosevelt was right to pack the court because that, that uh, had a direct impact on the, on the uh, 10th district in the effort to electrify, the, bring electricity to the Hill Country. Um, but, uh, and he was a liberal certainly uh, during his time at the, in the House until after Roosevelt's death and after World War II, you could see him start, uh, start to move back to the right as he was uh, 
as he was preparing to run for statewide office. Um, and of course, the, the country as a whole was becoming more conservative, and certainly Texas was becoming more conservative, so that by 1948, uh, he, he's espousing positions that, that are certainly, um, I, I would say, less liberal than they had been the previous decade. But then, particularly after he defeats Alan Shivers in 1956 in the battle for the control of the Democratic Party, and Shivers had taken the party machinery out of the party, and, and uh, they called them Shivercrats, supported Eisenhower, the whole party machinery did. And, and uh, LBJ, who was not up for re-election that year, but uh, challenged Shivers for control of the Texas delegation and the party machinery. Once he won that, he didn't have to face re-election again until 1960. So he had, um, he had four years to shift to the liberal side. That's the way she put it. And, and of course, the whole, the Democratic Party was moving in that direction, as was the Republican Party, too. This was uh, in terms of civil rights. I mean, the, the civil rights was a bipartisan legislation. It never would have passed without strong Republican support. And that's true of the 64 Act, as well as the 57 Act and, uh, and the earlier ones. Yes? Are, are you are you talking about the interviews with Mrs. Johnson? No, I wouldn't put you on the spot. Okay. The one that comes to mind, that there were, I mean, there were a lot of interviews, some with some Stevenson people, some with some LBJ people. Um, I, could, I could name some of them, I couldn't name all of them, but certainly the most memorable, uh, memorable and the most bizarre was the, I had sent a, a, a person on my oral history staff down to Alice, the Jim Wells County, to interview this guy who had been uh, an official and who had actually had custody of the, of the voting boxes. And um, they'd, they'd set an appointment, but um, his wife wouldn't let him in the door. And uh, so he came back empty handed. And, and uh, I thought that was kind of strange, but uh, that's the way it turned out. In any event, about a month or so later, Joe France, who had run the, do you know Joe France, the historian, who was really my mentor here at the University of Texas and had been my predecessor on the oral history program. Joe got a call from um, uh, Archer, Pyre, Archer uh, Parr, who was the, I guess the nephew of George Parr. I believe this is a, this is the one, the Archer Parr. There were several Archers, I gather, but and uh, he promised to deliver this guy. Tom Donald was his name. Uh, if we would meet him at a beer tavern at ten in the morning, <laughs> and so Joe and I drove down there and spent the night at a sleazy motel and um, and uh, <laughs> met these two old. Um, crusty old guys in the beer tavern, and after a couple of beers, they started, this was 10 in the morning, by the way, <laughs> they started talking about this, and, um, and so, yeah, that was, uh, that was certainly the most memorable uh, discussion. Um, interesting, but um, I should point out that, you know, so much focus has been on the irregularities in that race, and there were certainly irregularities there and throughout the state. Alvin Wirtz, remember LBJ had a 5,000 vote lead in 1941 when he ran against W. Leo Daniel, and those, uh, those uh, 5,000 votes disappeared, and uh, the Forks of the Creek vote came in. And, um, Alvin Wirtz had an expression that no Texas election is over until the last crooks have finished sending in their adjusted totals. <laughs> And, uh, and that was a good example. But you know what I think really elected Lyndon Johnson? Two things. I think the women who really rolled out the vote 
in the, in the runoff primary. He was 71,000 votes behind in the first primary. There was a third person in the, George Petty was the third person in the race. And LBJ almost didn't even compete, he was so far behind. But Mrs. Johnson gave a speech and said, you know, we're gonna try, we're gonna get as close as we can, and, uh, and the, the women really got out the vote, and I think, a, I can't prove this, but I think a lot of women voted for LBJ. The other thing that happened, Smith versus Allwright overturned the white primary in 1944. African Americans could vote in the Democratic primary in the runoff primary in 1948, and LBJ rolled up huge majorities in the black districts in Houston. And uh, I mean, he he did he, and I think that that was certainly a huge factor in his his election. Anything else? Yes. The way she would generally refer to things, if I would ask her something, she would say, that's something I don't like to remember. But she would generally talk about it. We did not discuss LBJ's extramarital affairs. Uh, it probably would have ended the interviews if we had. She was very sensitive. She would talk about the women with whom he had affairs. I mean, there, she talks at great length, for example, about Alice Glass and, and other women as well, but she doesn't talk about the affairs. And off tape, you know, she would talk only in general terms about their relationship, that more generically, Lyndon loved women and half of the people were women and, and uh, uh, but I also thought that she took her own vow seriously, and and I got the sense that she felt bound, even if he did not. Uh, but the other thing, she made a calculation that life with him was better than life without him. As so many uh, political wives in Washington did at the time, and. Uh, he gave her a very exciting life that she shared, and, and of course he would have been uh, toast if she had left him, if she had divor uh, divorced him in those years. So it was mutual. Yes? Until May of 2011, yeah. The, uh, I, I have no idea, um, and I was, just, I was walking by the uh, uh, front desk at the library one day, uh, I'd, I'd gone in to get something and the, the person who happened to be at the front desk was the one that I had worked with before on oral histories and she said, hey Mike, we're getting ready to open the Lady Bird Johnson oral histories. And uh, maybe a, a year or two earlier I'd had uh, lunch with my editor from Oxford who, uh, Oxford had published a second edition of my War on Poverty oral history. And she said, well, is there anything else you'd like to do with the LBJ oral histories? And I said, if they ever open Lady Bird Johnson's interviews, that would make a book. So um, it, it, I had the idea. In fact, I found a letter that I had written to Harry Middleton in 1991, right after I left the library, suggesting that they do a, a book then with the oral histories. And she was, she was still around, of course, it very much alive at that point. I saw her quite a bit in her, even, you know, in her latter years. You, you know, when a first lady dies, it's a state funeral and whatnot, and, and those who loved her were planning her funeral, but she was going to a lot of social events. She came over to my house for a book signing at, the year before she died and just had a wonderful time. You know, she couldn't talk, but she could write things out and she could gesture and nod and whatnot. But she was always going to events at the library and other places. Um, it's, it's amazing how active she was, really, until the last year of her life. Yes? How about when she passed away and we can publish this box? I can't hear you. Opera. 
Yeah, and uh, and the people were lining the streets. Um, yeah, and what really touched me about the funeral was the way all of our Secret Service agents uh, came and sat together. The, the agents were very fond of her, and she was fond of them. It was, uh, it was an interesting relationship. You know, she treated her staff like family. She really did. Uh, she didn't have, any, she, she was a very egalitarian woman. She would introduce you to someone like Lawrence Rockefeller as this, oh, you hear two people that need to meet each other, you know. <laughs> anything, uh, anything else? Well, you've been very patient. It's, uh, it's good to visit with you. I hope you found this useful, and um, I hope you'll buy the book if you haven't already. Thank you.